Welcome back. In this chapter, we will cover the accounting for purchases, accounts payable, and cash payments. This chapter shows how a merchandiser manages its purchases of goods for resale and its accounts payable. So the learning objectives for Section 1 would be to record purchases of merchandise on credit in a general journal and to compute the net delivered cost of purchases. In this chapter, you will learn how Max Out Sporting Goods manages its purchase of goods for resale and its accounts payable. And what I want to point out is that most merchandising businesses purchase goods on credit under an open account arrangement. Usually large firms have a centralized purchasing department that is responsible for locating suppliers, obtaining price quotations, negotiating credit terms, and also placing orders. However, in a small firm, in this case for small businesses, purchasing activities are usually handled by a single individual, usually the owner or the manager. And so for good internal control, normally um, there are three departments that would be involved in purchasing merchandise for a company. This is when we talk about large firms. This also applies to institutions as, like the one that you are attending. That's, this is a great part of my duties as a manager at this institution. And so you should study basic internal documents that are needed in the purchasing department and become familiar with them. These documents include a purchase requisition, a purchase order, receiving a report, and an invoice. So the sales department in this case sends an authorized purchase requisition to the purchasing department. And usually it goes to the purchasing department, which issues an authorized purchase order and sends to the select supplier, which then a receiving report is prepared when the merchandise is received. And then it goes to the accounting department who receives the invoice and copies of the purchase order and receiving report. Now, a purchase requisition lists the items to be ordered. This is what it looks like. It's just an example. It is signed by someone with the authority to approve requests for merchandise, usually the manager of the sales department. And the purchase order specifies the exact items, the quantity, the price, and credit terms and it is signed by someone with authority to approve purchases, which is usually the purchasing agent. And the receiving report is, repair, is prepared to show the quantity and the condition of the goods received, and the purchasing department receives a copy of the receiving report and compares it to the purchase order. So it's just checks and balances. Now, a purchase order is what the customer receives from the seller, and it is also the sales invoice for the seller, and the invoice is usually needed in order to pay the purchase order. So in this chapter, well, let's go back to what you learned in chapter seven. In chapter seven, we learned to account for the various sales and sales related transactions typically engaged by the merch merchandising firm. And in this chapter, we are going to learn to account for purchases and purchase related transactions. And the new accounts we will be using in this chapter are summarized on this table. We will be dealing with purchases which is a, an expense account. The normal balance is on the debit side and it's used to purchase merchandise inventory. We will also be dealing with purchase returns, which is a contra expense. The normal balance is usually on the credit side and, the return, and it's usually to record returns of merchandise inventory to the seller on the buyer's books. Um, we're also going to be dealing with purchase discounts, which is also a contra expense. The normal balance is on the credit side. 
and it's to record cash discounts taken for early payments to the seller by the buyer. And the final one would be freight in or transportation in, which is an expense account. The normal balance is on the debit side, and it's to record payment of trans uh, transportation costs on merchandise inventory purchased. Now the purchase of, um, the question is, what is the purchases account? So the purchase of merchandise for resale is a cost of doing business. And the purchase of merchandise is debited to the purchase account. And purchases is a temporary expense account classified as cost of good sold. And the cost of goods sold is the actual cost to the business of the merchandise sold to the customer. So in other words, it is the cost for you uh, to purchase an item that then you're going to resell most likely at a higher price so you can make a profit. Now, uh, this uh, what is a freight, freight in account? And so this is an expense account which is included in cost of goods sold and it shows transportation charges for merchandise purchased and it's also known as transportation in account. Now, in terms of FOB shipping point and FOB destination, if the freight terms are free on board, and what freight, uh, we covered this in earlier chapters in terms of FOB shipping point and FOB destination. Um, usually the buyer pays the freight charge, which is the cost of shipping the goods from the seller's warehouse to the buyer's location. And when we talk about FOB destination is when the seller pays the freight charges. And so there are two ways to handle the freight charges paid by the buyer, okay? So if the freight terms are free on board or FOB shipping point, the buyer pays the freight charge, which is the cost of shipping the goods from the seller's warehouse to the buyer's location. And if the freight terms are FOB destination, the seller pays the freight charges. So let's go over the two ways to handle the freight charges paid by the buyer. The buyer is billed directly by the transportation company for the freight charge, and the buyer issues a check directly to the freight company. Now the seller pays the freight charge and includes it on the invoice, and the invoice includes the price of the goods and the freight charge. Now the account is treated as a cost of goods sold account because it is, it increases the cost of the merchandise purchased. So here we have the price of goods, which is a debit purchase for $4,760. We have a freight charge, which is a debit and freight in for $360. So the total invoice, which is going to be in credits accounts payable, is 5120 and it shows you how to actually log this in in T accounts we have the purchase T account as a debit for 4760 to record the price of goods of the goods we also have the T account for freight in which is a debit for $360 and then we have the T account for accounts payable which is a credit of 5120 which is amounts to the total invoice. Okay, and remember that the cost of goods sold have a normal debit balances. Now, we're going to go into recording purchases of merchandise on credit in a general journal. And we are going to be dealing with um, with max out sporting goods. And Max Out Sporting Goods purchased merchandise from another company known as Modern Sportsman on January 15th. And Modern Sportsman paid the freight charge. 
and included it on their invoice, and the invoice is 1100. All this stuff is right here, what, what I'm talking about. And so the Max Out Sporting Good, Goods um, business enters the three elements in the accounting records. We have the price of goods, we have the freight charge, and we have the total invoice. It is exactly the example from the back uh, right here. Okay, I'm just showing you the example here, the way that we actually journalize this in the general journal. Okay, now the journal entry to record the purchases of merchandise on credit in a general journal and the posting to respective accounts is presented here. And it also shows you in relation to the general journal, how you will post them on the T account, depending on which T account you're dealing with. We're dealing with purchases, we're dealing with freight in and accounts payable. Purchases is a debit, freight in is 360, and accounts payable is 5120. Okay. Now, this is how the journal entry to record the payment should appear. This is the journal entry to record the payment of this invoice on January 30th using check number 152. And so we record it in the general journal by debiting accounts payable for 5120 and crediting the cash account since we're paying the invoice for 5120. And we add a description that says paid modern sportsman for our invoice 1100 with a check, check number 152. Remember that the description should be as detailed as you need it to be for you to understand what this transaction is about. In this case, it's about paying a particular company based on a specific invoice and you used a specific check number to do so. So it's... It's short, but at the same time detailed enough for you as a business owner to know and to link why you're making this payment. Now when merchandise arrives, so you've ordered it, now it's here, it has been delivered, it should be examined to confirm that it's in good condition, that it's satisfactory, and occasionally it happens that you get the wrong items shipped to you or the items are damaged or defective. And so a purchase return, we deal it with it when the business returns the goods. And the purchase allowance is when the purchaser keeps the goods but receives a reduction in the price of the goods. Remember, we've already covered this. They may be a little bit damaged, um, and the company, you as a business owner, is willing to take them because you can still sell them, so you'll get a reduction in price. Or it's the wrong item, but you're willing to keep it as well because maybe you liked it, that item and you didn't consider ordering it before. So you will keep it and you'll still negotiate a, a, a discount. Different scenarios, but we will be dealing with purchase return and purchase allowance as an account for this uh, particular chapter. Now, purchase returns and allowances are entered in the purchase returns and allowances account, not in the purchases account. So managers analyze this account to identify problem suppliers. It is a contra expense under the cost of goods sold and the normal balance of cost of goods sold um, account is usually on the debit side and the purchases return and allowances account has a normal credit balance okay this is how the journal entry should look like to record the, the transaction so on January 15th Max Out Sporting Goods received merchandise costing $4,760 from Modern Sportsman 
with freight charges of $360 paid by Modern Sportsman. And this is the original entry that was made on January 15th. We have the purchases, the freight in, and the accounts payable. This is exactly what I talked about earlier in the couple slides. Now, this is to record purchases, returns, and allowances based on that purchase. Notice that the entry to record the receipt of the credit memorandum from Modern Sportsman reduces the accounts payable by debiting it for $476. And why this is happening is because some goods that were received were damaged and the supplier granted a $476 purchase allowance on their credit memo, which is credit memo number 103 dated on January 27th. So this is how we record that credit allowance, that purchase allowance. We debit the accounts payable for $476 and we credit the purchases return and allowances for $476 and we add a description. Received credit memo 103, it's up here, for an allowance for damaged merchandise. The original invoice was invoice 1100 on January 15th, 2016. Okay, this is the amount owed to Modern Sportsman after the purchase allowance. So, um, originally it was owed $5,120, but we received a credit of $476. So, if you minus... $476 from the original amount of $5,120. Your total is $4,644. And the entry to pay the amount owed to Modern Sportsman on January 31st with the check number, check number 153, is presented on this slide. So we debit accounts payable for $4,644 and we credit the cash account for $4,644. This is paid amount due on invoice 1100 to Modern Sportsman after receipt of credit memo 103, check 153. Notice that now it has a little more information. The earlier transaction of payment did not include a, a uh, purchase allowance. So it had less information. It was it just said that it was paid uh, for a particular invoice with a check number. Now we have that information as well, but we need to make sure that we add the fact that we received a credit, and that credit came from Memo 103. And it shows the T's accounts that are here, which is the accounts payable and the purchases return of allowances to show the credit. Purchases discounts. So a business may be able to take advantage of an early payment discount if it pays the invoice within a certain period of time. We covered this in previous chapters when we were reviewing the accounting cycle. So here are some examples of credit terms which a seller might give a firm on a purchase. So take a moment to review the most common ones. We have cash discounts which are given to encourage early payment. And a cash discount is a discount offered by suppliers for payment received within specific period of time. And if a customer pays within a period of time, it may receive a cash discount called a purchase discount. Okay, so usually you have net 30 days, net 30, and it's usually on your invoice, it shows as N slash 30 which means that payment is due in full within 30 days and af after the date of the invoice, okay? And if it says net 30, I mean net 10, uh, then the payment is, is uh, in full is due 10 days after the end of the month, which is the, in which, um, the invoice was issued. And then you have another one which is 2% 10 days or net 30 days and this is the way it shows in the invoice, 
that is, if a payment is made within 10 days of the invoice date, then the customer can take a 2% discount. Okay, so this is where this comes from. You got a 2% discount if you pay within 10 days. If not, then the payment is due in 30 days at the full invoice amount. Now, um, we're going to be recording purchase discounts. So max out sporting goods received merchandise costing $3,000 from the Modern Sportsman on January 10th. Invoice number is 880. The terms is 210 net 30, meaning you get a 2% discount if you pay within 10 days. If not, it's due in 30 days with freight charges of $200 paid by Modern Sportsman and added to the invoice. And this is how it uh, max out sporting goods would record the purchases as presented in this slide. You have purchases as a debit for $3,000. We have a debit and freight in for $200. So the total amount that this is gonna cost your business or max out sporting goods is $3,200 is going to be credited to the accounts payable for $3,200. And it is to purchase merchandise for Modern Sportsman from invoice 880 with terms 210 net 30. Okay? Now, obviously we get a 2% discount if we pay within 10 days. So this is the way that we would record that discount. Max out sporting goods paid the amount due after deducting a $60 discount, which is 2% of 3,000, and it paid on January 19th with check number 150. So obviously they are gonna pay within the 10 days, so we are entitled to a 2% discount. So the way we do that, we first determine what our discount's going to be, and in order to determine the 2% from 3,000, all you do is multiply 3,000 times 2%, which is $60. And we record that by crediting, I mean, I'm sorry, debiting accounts payable for $3,200 and uh, crediting purchase discounts for $60. And then we credit our cash account for $3,140. Why $3,140? because we were entitled to a 2% discount, which is amounts to $60. So if we subtract $3,200 minus 60, it gives us $3,140. So we're not paying $3,200, we're actually paying out of our pockets $3,140. And this is to pay balance owed to Modern Sportsman invoice 880 with check number 150. Hope this is all making sense to you. So. If you notice, we are going back to the accounting cycle with concepts that you have already covered in the first six, ch six chapters. However, we're actually taking those concepts and we are integrating them with more information that actually mirrors what happens in a business. You purchase items, you, have, you get discounts on certain items, some stuff are damaged, so you gotta return them back or ask for a discount. You have to deal with invoices, you have to deal with check numbers, you have to deal with purchase orders, requisitions, and all that stuff is coming together in this chapter, in the chapter before, uh, for chapter seven. So, to illustrate this, now we're gonna do purchase return, process with a discount period. Uh, so to illustrate a purchase of $500, from Modern Sportsman on January 11th with terms 210 net 30 with freight charges of $25 was added. Uh, invoice 910 and we had a return of $100 on January 12th. So we had a credit memorandum and the final payment on January 20th was with check 149. So let's read this. If there is a purchase return process within the discount period, let's read it again. If there is a purchase return processed within 
the discount period, the buyer is entitled to take the cash discount only on the balance owed after the return. Okay, let's read it again. If there is a purchase return processed within the discount period, the buyer is entitled to take the cash discount only on the balance owed after the return. So not the entire amount, okay? So, if there was a purchase of $500 from Modern Sportsman on January 11th, and the terms were 210 net 30 with a freight cost of $25, and then a return of $100 occurred uh, the next day, then the final payment on January 20th is going to be different and reflected on this general journal right here. The amount to be paid on January 20th is $417, not $425. And we calculate that because the original amount owed was $525. We had a return for $100, so the difference is $425. And then we were entitled to a 2% discount on the original on the on the original amount four hundred dollars so the amount paid is four hundred and seventeen dollars okay so um in terms of computing the net delivered of cost the delivered cost of purchases um the income statement of uh, merchandising businesses contains a section showing the total cost of purchases. And so the purchase account accumulates the cost of merchandise bought for resale. And the income statement of a merchandising business contains a section showing the total cost of purchases. And this section uh, combines information about the cost of the purchases, the freight in, the purchase returns, and the allowances and the purchase discounts for the period, okay? Now take a moment to review the calculation on the slide for the net delivered cost of purchases. In chapter 13, um, which will um, actually show you how to complete the income statement for a merchandise business, um, it shows you how that is prepared and you will learn about the cost of goods sold section and how the net delivered cost of purchases is issued in calculating the results of operation. Okay, we're almost, almost there. We're not going to be going into section two. Let me just find. Um, so in section two, we're going to be talking about accounts payable. And the objectives are to post the general journal to the general ledger accounts, post transactions to the accounts payable subsidiary ledger, prepare a schedule of accounts payable, demonstrate a knowledge of the procedures for effective internal control of purchases and to record purchases, sales, returns, cash payments, and cash receipts using the perpetual inventory system. So let's go into that. In terms of accounts payable, uh, usually, um, let's read what it says here, recording merchandise purchase with a trade discount. So International Sportsman offers merchandise for sale with a list price of $1,000 with trade discounts of 20% and 10% with terms 210 net 30. And then Max Out Sporting Goods purchases merchandise with a list price from International Sportsman with invoice 5201. 
And so the amount owed for the purchase is computed as followed. We have the list price of $1,000 minus the first discount, which is a 20% discount, which amounts to $200. So the difference eight, uh, between $1,000 and $200 is $800. And then we also have to compute a second discount, which is a 10% discount because we're paying it within the 10 days which amounts to $80, so our total invoice price is $720. Businesses that buy merchandise on credit can conduct more extensive operations and use financial resources more effectively than if they paid cash for all purchases. So it's important to pay invoices on time so that the business maintains a good credit reputation with its suppliers, obviously. Uh, but also to take advantage of the discounts. Uh, recall from Chapter 7 that certain wholesale businesses offer goods to trade um, customers within the price computed using the trade discounts. Okay, so making sure that you take advantage of that is key for your business. So the journal entry to record the purchase on January 20th is presented in this slide, and that is based on this scenario here. If Max Out Sporting Goods pays the invoice within 10 days, it will be entitled to a, uh, a $14.40 discount, which is a 2% discount from $720. And the amount paid will be actually $705.60 once you um, take the difference of the discount. So $720 minus $14.40 equals to $705.60. And so the journal entry to record the payment on January 29th with check number 151 is presented in this slide. We have two parts the purchase for $720 on credit for accounts payable, and it's to purchase the merchandise on credit for invoice 5201 with the terms 210 net 30 and in order to pay that the transaction to journalize that in the general journal is by debiting accounts payable for seven hundred and twenty dollars whoops we have a discount so we have to credit the discount of fourteen dollars and forty cents that's twenty percent of seven hundred and twenty dollars and then you're crediting your cash account because you're not going to be paying $720. Now you're going to be paying $705 with 60 cents. And that is to pay the balance owed to Modern Sportman, Sportsman for invoice number 5201 with check number 151. Our objective for number three is to process, um, uh, to post the the from the general journal to the general ledger accounts and the process for posting to the general ledger is done in the same manner that we have covered in chapter four so if you have any questions on that please refer back to chapter four and so um, in accounts in accounts payable ledger it's a subsidiary ledger that contains a separate account for each creditor and many businesses uses an accounts payable subsidiary ledger to track the amount owed. Usually they track to whom they are owed, when they are due, and the discount terms. And this ensures that the firm will have enough cash to pay for its obligations to operate the business. So let's review what an account payable subsidiary ledger looks like. It is sem similar to the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger discussed in the previous chapter. Okay, and this is what it looks like. It has the accounts payable has uh, the accounts payable ledger has three money columns. Remember that the difference between the general ledger and the subsidiary ledger. Think about it when you are looking at your accounts, your bank account. Usually, you receive a general statement of all the transactions that happen uh, with your account, whether you paid for gas, groceries, whether you paid um, bills. But then in, when you go into the ledger, you want to make sure that you um, 
separate those transactions so you have a better way of tracking it. And then one difference that differentiates the general ledger from this uh, payable ledger is the balance. Every time that you have a transaction, you make sure you record the balance. So what it's showing you here is that Modern Sportsman um, had a balance of $1,600. And then there was a transaction for an invoice for $720 as a credit. So now instead of $1,600, now there's a balance of $2,320 in that account. So posting from the general journal to the accounts payable ledger is similar to posting the accounts receivable subsidiary ledger. And the posting to the vendor's account in the accounts payable subsidiary ledger is signified by a slash, okay, followed by a check mark after the account number for the accounts payable in the charts of accounts. So for objective number five is to prepare a schedule of accounts payable. The schedule of accounts payable displays the balances of all vendors or creditor accounts and the total of all of the vendor accounts will equal the total balance in the general ledger accounts payable control account and the schedule of accounts payable is particularly important to a business owner or the accounts payable manager if it's a large scale um, firm. And it's important in keeping track of how much money the company owes and when the amount is due. Okay, so now let's go into the schedule schedule of accounts payable um, and this is the total of all vendor balances and one thing to note here is that the total of all vendor balances must equal the total in the accounts payable control account in the general ledger so notice in this figure on the schedule of accounts payable it matches the control total of accounts payable in the ledger. Okay? This is all just informational item. For objective number six, you have to demonstrate a knowledge of the intern of the procedures for effective internal control of purchases. So um, let's go into that. The objective of the controls are to create written proof that purchases and payments are authorized and also to ensure that different people are involved in the process of buying goods, receiving goods, and making payments. And because of the large amount of money spent to buy goods, most businesses develop careful procedures for the control of purchases and payments. Some firms have a voucher system, a special system used to achieve internal control, but whether the voucher system is used or not, a business should be sure that its control process includes sufficient safeguards, whatever that may be. It, it, it all depends on the type of business that you're running. If it's small, then it, must, um, it may have some smaller scale safeguards. However, when you're talking about large scale firms, then there are multiple safeguards um, that it can be implemented. It all depends. And so for the internal control of purchases, we have an effective system to have uh, controls or safeguards in place. And the key here is separating duties among employees, which will provide a system of checks and balances. I did talk about this in the earlier chapters as well, how one department may be in charge of ordering while the another department may be in charge for authorizing the order and another department which will be authorized to receive the item and check it against the invoice and another person or another department in charge of cutting a check. 
that's all about separating duties among employees and it provides a system of checks and balances. So in a small business with just a few employees, it might be difficult or sometimes even impossible to separate duties, especially if it's only one person running the entire business, there's no employees involved. However, the business should design an effective set of control procedures in terms of considering the company's resources. So it doesn't matter if it's just one person or you have a large scale firm, you should have effective set of control purchases uh, depending on the resources that are allowed. And effective systems um, will have controls in place no matter if it's small or large, like I said. So take a moment to review these internal controls related to the purchasing processes. For one, we have, whoops, let's go back. Um, it will have uh, number one, all purchases should be made only after proper authorization has been given in writing. And then the goods should be carefully checked when received. They should be then, then they should then be compared with the purchase order and with the invoice received from the supplier. And then the purchase order, uh, receiving report and invoice should be checked to confirm that the information on the document is in agreement. And then the computations on the invoice should be checked for accuracy. Then we go into the authorization for payment. It should be made by someone other than the person who ordered the goods. And this authorization should be given only after all the verifications have been made. And then another person should write the check for the payment. Obviously, they, this may be a little hard if it's just a business run by one person. And then, um, the, the, the last step is to pre-number forms, um, or you should use pre-number forms uh, to purchase requisitions, purchase orders, and checks. So, what it, and this is to period, um, what it's saying is, is that you shouldn't have you shouldn't be making invoice numbers or purchase order numbers as you go. It's easier to just have it pre-numbered so that you know when a purchase not when a when a certain document has not been used or avoided. So for example, checks. Checks you order a checkbook, they come pre-numbered, and so you usually reconcile your bank your bank account to look and see if all your checks were properly charged. And you may notice that you go from check number 100 to check number 102. And you're wondering, well, what happened to check number 101? Um, and then you check your checkbook and you notice that you voided that check. So you know specifically, okay, I didn't use that check because I voided that check. Um, you can't have that type of internal control if your number if your checks are not numbered it will not be the same if you number your checks as you go so um so this is where pre-number forms should be used for purchase requisitions purchase orders and checks and to period um, periodically the numbers of the documents issued should be verified to make sure that all forms can be accounted for just like in my example for your checkbook the last objective is to record purchases, sales returns, cash payments, and cash receipts using the perpetual inventory system. So let's go over what the perpetual inventory system is. Uh, when the perpetual system is used, an account called merchandise inventory replaces all of the purchase related accounts. Additionally, the perpetual inventory accounting requires a second entry when sales are made. And then lastly, summarized journal entries using both systems are summarized on the next few slides. So there are significant differences between a periodic inventory system, which you have learned so far, and a perpetual inventory system. When the periodic system is used, the inventory records, uh, the inventory records are only updated when a physical inventory is taken. And this system is adequate 
for most small businesses. Larger businesses may require up-to-date information of inventories on hand and use of the perpetual system. So take a moment to review the next few slides which will show the similarities and the differences between the two inventory systems, okay? Here we have purchases with the perpetual under the perpetual inventory system. And the journal the the journal entries that are stated here would be used by a company that uses a periodic inventory system. And you can compare that to the company that uses a perpetual inventory system. So this is a good table to keep. Gives you the transaction. For example, on June 30th, purchase merchandise inventory for $2,050 with a freight cost of $120 from Holtz Industry with invoice 5, 0 to 7, and the, net ter and the terms are 2, 10, net 30, so 2% discount if paid under 10 days. If not, it's due in 30 days. The periodic system will record it, re will record it in this manner. It would debit the purchases for $2,050. It would debit the freight in for $120, and it will credit the accounts payable for Holtz Industry for $2,170. The perpetual inventory, remember that now we're using merchandise inventory, so it will debit merchandise inventory for the entire amount, $2,170, so it's the purchases plus the freight in. And then it will credit the accounts payable for $2,170. This is the difference in how we journalize our entry versus one system or the other. In this case, the periodic system and the perpetual system. So now let's keep on going with another sample. So on June 22nd, uh, you received a credit memorandum, number 110, for $150 from Holtz Industry because of defective product that was returned. And they were originally purchased on invoice 5027 dated on June 20th. So you received product that was defective based on this order here on the top. So you're going to take a credit of $150. If we're in the periodic system, you would debit accounts payable in this term for uh, Holtz Industries for $150. And then you would credit purchase returns and allowances for $150. On the perpetual system, you debit accounts payable for $150 and you credit merchandise inventory for $150. Okay, now on July 1st, there was sold merchandise on credit to Cervantes Company. So now you're selling your merchandise and you issued invoice 109 for $1,250, and you gave a term of 210 net 30. And so the cost of the merchandise sold was actually $800. So what this is saying is that you sold items or merchandise that it cost you $800 to purchase, but you sold it to another person, another company for $1,250. So how are you going to record that? In the per periodic system, you would debit accounts receivable for Cervantes company. Remember, always put in the company you're dealing with so you know where your purchases and sales are going to. And that's a debit of $1,250. And then you credit the sales for $1,250. Whoops. Okay. If you were in the perpetual system, you would debit accounts receivable for Cervantes Company for $1,250. You would credit sales for $1,250. So this is actually recording in the perpetual system. It's a two-step. You record the sales, and then you record the cost of goods sold. And the cost of goods sold, you debit the cost of goods sold account for $800 and then you credit your merchandise inventory by $800 because you have to reduce your inventory. Then lastly, on July 3rd, you issued credit memorandum one through 138 
for $50 to Cervantes Company for defective product returned. They were originally purchased in, um, with invoice 109, dated July 1st, and the cost of the merchandise returned was $32. So now we're reversing this, okay? You learned when you buy things from another company, which are these top two right here, okay? You buy merchandise from another company and you find that they're defective, so you take a discount and you pay the company that you purchased the items from uh, reflecting that discount. And now the last two here, you're selling merchandise, so the inventory that you purchased from another company, you're reselling it at a higher price to another company. And now when they got the inventory, they, they came back and said, okay, some of the product was defective. Um, so we're going to return it and we're going to give a credit of $50, but that those items that are being returned to us did not cost us $50. It cost us $32. So in order to record that in the periodic system, you debit sales returns and allowances for $50 and you credit accounts receivable for Cervantes company for $50, okay? On the perpetual system, you debit sales returns and allowances for $50, and you credit accounts receivable for Cervantes company for $50. So this is the part of how much you sold it to them and how much you're giving them credit. However, just like the top part here, you have to record something for to document how much the items actually cost to you. So this is where the second part comes in. You debit merchandise inventory for $32 and you credit cost of goods sold for $32. Hope this is all coming together for you, okay? All right, we're almost done. This is the last slide. So on July 1st, Issue check 38220 for $1,982 to Holtz Industry was given for invoice on June 20th minus the return of June 22nd and minus the cash discount of $38. So now you're paying, you're paying Holtz Industry for an invoice that was on June 20th, but you're not going to pay the entire invoice. Let's go back and see what June 20th was, the, the entire invoice was for $21.17, right? You're not going to do that. You're not going to pay the whole thing because you're going to return, you're going to minus the return that happened on June 22nd, and you're going to also minus the cash discount of $38. So when you do that, in the periodic system, you're going to debit accounts payable for Holtz Industries. Notice that you have to name that industry that you're dealing with so you know where what's happening, okay? And that debit's going to be for $2,020. And you're going to credit purchase discounts for $38. So the actual cash that you paid, uh, you credit that for $1,982. And the perpetual system, you debit accounts payable for Holtz Industries for 2020, and then you credit the merchandise inventory for $38, and you credit your cash account for $1,982. And the last transaction on July 9th, you received a check for $1,176 from Cervantes Company for, invo for an invoice on July 1st, Minus the return on July 3rd and minus a discount of $24. So remember, you sold merchandise to Cervantes Company, but they returned some of it because it was defective. And they also paid on time to take advantage of the discount of $24. So in the periodic system, you debit cash for $1,176. You also debit the sales discount of $24, and you credit accounts receivable for Cervantes Company for $1,200.
On the perpetual system, you would debit the cash account for $1,176. You would debit the sales discount for $24. And then you would credit accounts receivable for Cervantes Company for $1,200. Okay? So that is it. These last two slides actually will cover everything that you need to know for your homework assignment. Your homework assignment will actually ask you to do transactions as a buyer and as a seller. So it'll be good to refer back to those two slides. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Contact me by email or text me or go to my office hours. Always schedule an appointment with me and I will be glad to help you in any way I can, whether online or in person, okay, or on the phone. Good luck to you.